Good morning, it's Friday the 7th of July and welcome to this look at the week ahead beginning the 10th of July with me, Michael Hewson, Chief Market Analyst at CMC Markets. There's quite a bit to get through after this week's market carnage with European markets on course for their worst weekly performance since March. The DAX has fallen to its lowest levels in three months while the FTSE 100 has slipped to within touching distance of its March lows. And we can see that played out in this chart here. As you can see, I've drawn in uh, the move from the October lows to the record highs back in February. How quickly that move has unwound. We're now approaching 61.8 Fibonacci retracement level of that entire up move. The move that um, we saw the bounce of back in March I think what's particularly concerning about this particular um, chart is the fact that the C100 has struggled to rally and make new highs. And that for me, I think is a bit of a warning sign when it comes to what financial markets, European markets are likely to do next. Because you know, while the C100 also underperformed on a half year basis, we've also started to see evidence of a breakdown in other European markets as well. And that's before we even get today's non-farm payrolls data. Um, but before we get onto that, getting slightly ahead of myself, because obviously we need to understand why in the past two or three days, markets have suddenly um, lost the plot, so to speak, because we had a fairly decent first half Despite the sell-off this week in European markets, US markets, although weak, haven't fallen by anywhere near as much, and yet their valuations are an awful lot higher. So what gives? Well, um, if you've got the answer, please let me know because I'm scratching my head. Um, we did see a fall in US markets this week. Um, I think the common denominator has been pretty much a concern about an upcoming recession. Um, China data this week has been particularly disappointing and the reluctance of Chinese authorities to consider a significant stimulus plan, I think is raising concerns about the likelihood of them actually meeting their GDP targets for this year. But more broadly, I think um, the the, the main reason for the sell-off is the market's interpretation of not only the Fed minutes that we saw on Wednesday, there shouldn't really have been um, any surprises from them, but um, the market appears to have reacted as if they were. They showed a much greater caucus for further tightening than was thought. The direction of travel was given added momentum on Thursday with an absolutely blowout ADP payroll support, as well as a fairly, fairly decent ISM services report. So you've got a, you've got a number of things that are driving yields higher. Um, and that's no better borne out by this chart here. This is the US two year yield. Um, we can see that it's retested the highs back in March. But what's particularly interesting about this particular chart is the fact that even though um, we retested those March peaks, we actually closed well off the highs. Now, there's a lot, there's a lot to break down in the way this bond market move has played out. Um, we can look at the US two year. So markets are pricing in, essentially the markets are pricing in much more aggressive Fed tightening than was originally thought to have been the case um, a month ago. Um, the payrolls report was certainly a decent report, but when you actually look at it a little bit closer, um, an awful lot of the jobs that were added were in travel and leisure and hospitality, which generally tend to be at the lower range of the wage scale when it comes to wages. And certainly the wages numbers in the ADP report were lower than the previous month. 
yes, still fairly high above 6%, but certainly heading in the right direction. But nonetheless, we've seen a big spike in yields. So the US two year at its highest level in 16 years. We also saw a similarly robust move higher in UK two year gilt yields as well. Um, I mean, we're well beyond the October highs now. And levels last seen back in 2007, 2008, we were at one stage above five and a half percent. And essentially what you've got is markets pricing in a higher Fed funds terminal rate and a higher Bank of England bank rate. So Fed funds markets are now looking at potentially not only a July rate hike, let's forget about that, that's priced in, that's going to happen. But it's really what comes after that that markets are concerned about. Similarly for the Bank of England, it's really, it's not about what's going to happen in July and August um, when it comes to rates. It's how much more the central banks likely to do over and above the rate hikes that are already priced in. And certainly I think UK markets are getting out way out of it, way over, way over their skis when it comes to expectations of bank rate. Currently it's at 5%. I can potentially see bank rate going to five and a half, any more than that. And I think you're going to create a smoking ruin in the UK economy. The housing market will fall quite substantially. And quite simply, what we're seeing here from central banks is an overcompensation for the fact that they were late, very late, in recognizing that inflation was not transitory and was likely to remain higher for longer. They've been given an awful lot of criticism for that, quite rightly. And now they're looking to try and overcompensate for that, try and restore some credibility by saying, look, we're serious about our inflation mandate. We're going to push it back to 2% without really asking the question whether or not they should be trying to push it back to 2% in such a short space of time. I think that 2% inflation target was a good target for its time, but I certainly think it's unrealistic to drive it back to 2% quickly, given the current challenges facing the global economy in the UK and US economies. Because ultimately, when we're talking about transitioning to net zero, you're not going to be able to do that, make the economic changes to um, the economy, while at the same time, keeping inflation in check. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has changed global supply chains forever. You are not going to have prices returning back to the levels that they were pre-pandemic. It is not going to happen. It's not realistic. And ultimately, central banks need to get acquainted and get comfortable with that fact. You can get inflation back to the 2% target, but you know that you don't need to do it within the next one or two years. You may have to get used to the idea that interest rates are likely to remain higher for longer. So you may be able to get inflation back to 4%, 3.5%, or even 3% in the case of the US, because we've got US CPI next week. But getting that it, getting it to that extra. Um, one or two percent from the three or four percent, which I think is likely to be over the course of the next two years, is going to take a lot longer. And perhaps a little bit of patience might save an awful lot of economic pain for an awful lot of people who can probably least afford it. Um, We don't know the effects, the full effects of the five percent of rate hikes that have already been pushed through, simply on the basis of the fact that US operates a fixed rate mortgage system. So ultimately, people won't want to move if it means that they have to come off their low fixed rate mortgage onto a higher fixed rate mortgage. Similarly, here in the UK, um, we have a slightly shorter term fixed rate mortgage market, but we do have a fixed rate mortgage nonetheless. And ultimately, while those people who are on fixed rate mortgages and do have savings, they're actually benefiting in the short term from higher savings rates. So there is a significant lag when it comes to monetary policy. Um, Certainly a bigger lag than was the case 20 or 30 years ago when pretty much everyone was on variables. So I think central banks 
are not taking that into account. And ultimately, I think they need to do so. Um, the Bank of England would be well advised to probably keep rates on hold after the, the rate hike in August and see what happens. If they, need, if they then need to hike rates again in December by the end of the year, then fine. But at the moment, they're flying blind because they do not know how much of the 5% of rate hikes that they've already implemented and pushed through into the economy, how much of that has actually had an effect or will have an effect when it suddenly starts to transmit itself into uh, the economy in Q3 and Q4. Anyway, rent over. We've got, we've had ADP payroll support came in at 497,000, well above market expectations. We also had a very resilient services ISM. We've got non-farm payrolls as well um, later today, and that is likely to be another fairly decent number. US unemployment is around about 3.6%. Six percent, um, three point seven percent, and average, average, average earnings, average hourly earnings is around about four point three percent. So I don't think there's going to be anything in those numbers that's likely to deter the Fed from hiking again in July, um, in just under two weeks' time. Got US CPI next week, that is expected to fall back to three percent. Yes, core prices are higher, but core prices are also expected to decline as well, or soften as well, coming back down from 5.5 to around about 5.2, 5.3. They will always take an, an awful lot longer to come down or slow down. But certainly on a headline number, 3% US CPI. Think about that. It was 9.1% this time last year. That was the peak. So extrapolate that out and where the UK peak was, then you could potentially argue that by the end of this year, UK inflation could be around about um, five and a half or six percent, given the fact that in July, the energy price cap comes down. In October, it could come down again as well. So that could actually shave an awful lot off the current 8.7 percent, which is UK CPI. Nonetheless, um, markets are pricing in. The Bank of England um, could hike rates to as high as six and a half percent. I really struggle with that. I mean, yeah, the market is pricing it, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen. And I think if the if the Bank of England does hike to six and a half percent, then it's going to be a very very difficult um, few years for an awful lot of people going forward. So I think that's something that really does need to be borne in mind um, when looking at the market pricing. I think 5.5% is probably the limit of what the economy would stand without creating a smoking ruin. And I think the, the Bank of England really needs to weigh up, its, you know, weigh up the probabilities of the damage it might cause. Looking at PPI, inflation is coming down. Are you seeing it in China? You're seeing it in Europe? You're seeing it in the US? There will be a pass-through effect. Sometimes a little bit of patience is required. And I think the Bank of England, the Federal Reserve, the ECB could exercise some of that patience that uh, they used in delaying hiking rates in trying to delay a little bit further because essentially they haven't had the opportunity to see how much um, of the 500 basis points they've already done has already impacted going forward. They're constantly backward looking. They should start to think about the effects of what they've already done in terms of being forward looking. And it's, it's a difficult mindset, but it's something that they really need to do. Um, but anyway, talking um, and looking at what uh, equity markets are doing with respect to the DAX. We've broken out of that nice little support line that um, I've highlighted over the course of the last few weeks, around about 15,600. Um, that suggests we're probably going to see further weakness back towards, you know, I'm not really sure why I put this line in here. Yeah, it coincides with those peaks and those lows there. So, you, you could find a little bit of support around about 15,100, but I would suggest potentially we could see a drift down to 15,000. But in the wider scheme of things, 
given the fact that we've probably gone sideways since April. Um, a move lower would not be the end of the world, and we are still well above uh, the March lows, unlike the FTSE 100. So it's certainly not the end of the world. Certainly seen a little bit of a meltdown and a spike up in yields, which is weighing on the market. The big question, I think, for me is whether the spike up in yields is sustainable in the short to medium term. Yesterday, the France, the CAC 40, got absolutely hammered. Um, again, we're back down towards the May lows. Again, we're still above the March lows. Um, we're also above the 200-day moving average. So ultimately, while we are starting to see a little bit of a fading of momentum, we're still above some very key low points. The low points in December, the low points in March, and obviously the low points in October. So yeah, momentum is declining. We've taken out these lows here. That is a bit of a worry, but we're still above the long-term moving average. So uh, you know, this, this 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 correction in European markets is a little bit worrying, but it's certainly not at the moment the end of the world when it comes to future gains going forward. US markets, surprisingly, have proven to be much more resilient to this move higher in yields. And we can certainly see this in the way the S&P 500 has been playing out. We have started a rollover. Obviously, it was a big down move yesterday. But, you know, big down moves haven't been unusual over the course of the past few weeks. We've had them on a fairly regular basis and have continued to go higher. I think the bigger question is um, how much longer can US markets continue to defy gravity? Because ultimately, when you actually look at the fundamentals, the earnings numbers, the fact that earnings growth is likely to diminish, how much longer can markets continue to defy gravity? Well, ultimately, we won't know until such times as we until such times as we take out this low here. Because at the moment we're still making higher lows, we're still making higher highs, which means the uptrend, despite the move higher in yields, still remains intact. And for me, what the price is doing is key. You know, you cannot buck the trend. I mean, again, here we've seen the Nasdaq retest those June highs through here. So we've made, we continue to make higher highs, we continue to make higher lows. So again, the key support level is these twin lows back in June, around about 14,680. So there or thereabouts. If we start to break down below there, then certainly there is potential for us to see a little bit of a rollover. But again, I think much will depend on whether or not the markets continue to price in a much more aggressive Fed. Next week's CPI numbers could be very important in that context, as could the PPI numbers, which come out the day after. In fact, I could potentially make the case for the PPI numbers potentially being more important than the CPI numbers. Why? Well, quite simply, if the year-on-year -year numbers um, start to fall back to around about 2% and the month-on-month -month numbers start to go negative, like they did in May on the final demand, then you can certainly make the case that the US economy could find that it's heading towards um, deflation or certainly disinflation at the very least. So PPI is on, th on the 13th and CPI is on the 12th. So I think both of those, those numbers next week could be important in the context of the yield story that we've seen play out over the course of the last couple of days. So obviously we've got payrolls today. Yes, they'll be important, but they won't add to the, uh, the sum of overall knowledge when it comes to a July rate hike. We're getting that. It's really a matter of what comes after that. Um, so we've had a look at the key indices going forward. We've also got some fairly important um, UK data, UK wages and unemployment. And one of the things that I have been surprised at is despite the fact that UK rates continue to go higher, the pound has continued to hold its own. And I think one of, one of the things that I took away, I think, from this, or have taken away from this week, is that there was a piece on Bloomberg the other day that suggested that, yes, while interest rates, higher rates are impacting the mortgage market, 
because an awful lot of people are on two and five year mortgages, but also have a high degree of savings, there is a bit of an offset there because ultimately they're getting more for their savings, which is helping potentially to add to their overall income. And the mortgage effect hasn't as yet kicked in. And in effect, what they could do with those um, additional savings is potentially um, pay down some of that mortgage debt to make it more manageable when their fixed rate deal rolls off. Having said that, generally, if you've got a mortgage, you probably don't have an awful lot of savings. But then again, if you're paying an interest rate of around about one or two percent, um, you know, maybe you could make savings in other areas. Um, it's a complicated subject, but but ultimately the pound continues to hold up reasonably well, still above its 50 day moving average, and it continues to hold above this trend line support from the lows back in March. So ultimately, it still continues to look fairly resilient against the dollar and also against the euro. Um, it's continued to drift lower, finding a decent area of support in and around this 85.20 area, 85.15.20. If we get a break below 85, then you could well see further losses back towards the lows that we saw back in August of last year at around about um, 84 and 83.80. But looking at the way that this has been drifting over the course, the highs have been getting lower. And unless we take out the 50 day moving average, which is currently acting as a fairly decent resistance level, we could start to see um, the euro start to break lower, but it is pretty glacial in nature. Euro dollar, um, again, it's a bit of a struggle, this one. We're finding a little bit of support in and around this 108, 20, 30 area. So you could see a little bit of stop loss um, selling on a move below 108.20. Also notable that these peaks here are lower. Every rally up, down, up, down, up, down. So perhaps we could see further euro losses on a break below 108.20 and back towards 107. I still think we're pretty much in a range trade for euro dollar. I really don't see it breaking out of that um, anytime soon. I still think that we're potentially closer to um, the peak for rates than markets are currently pricing. But again, you know, I'm sort of placing that more on the basis of instinct than anything else. If we look at dollar yen, here we go. Dollar yen does appear to be starting to break down. Um, we had a bearish engulfing day there. We traded sideways for a week. We found decent support around about 144. We finally broke in below that, um, which would suggest that perhaps we could start to see a little bit of yen strength, a little bit of dollar weakness in the short to medium term. On the weekly chart, it's quite interesting. Be interested to see how that plays out over the course of the next few days. But certainly, I think there is. I think we might, we might have seen a short term peak at 145 and we could be looking for a retest of 142.50. 142.50 was the previous 61.8 Fibonacci retracement level of this entire down move. I mean, this is one, this is a mere culprit on my part, on my part, completely misread what dollar yen was going to do this year. I thought that the Japanese central bank, the Bank of Japan, would look at tweaking its yield curve control. It doesn't appear any closer to doing that than it was um, six months ago, um, which is surprising when you consider that core inflation is now at 4.3%. So, um, you know, that just goes to show that, you know, once once a trade idea goes wrong, you don't run it all the way back. And certainly I wouldn't I wouldn't have been running a short position from here. So I'm still still a little bit unsure about the, the future of dollar yen. I think an awful lot will depend on how close to US peak rates we are. Um, certainly the rollover in dollar yen here does suggest that we are we could see a little bit of a correction back towards 140, but we'll have to see how that plays out going forward. We've also got the Bank of Canada next week, Bank of Canada rate decision. Um, we did see a rate hike um, 
at the last decision and there is there is a chance we could see another one um, this week when they um, when they meet on Tuesday, Tuesday the 12th. They tweaked their guidance at the last meeting, suggesting the need for further rate hikes, which obviously gives them more flexibility when it comes to raising rates or choosing to hold them. Any decision, I think, could well be tempered by the current business outlook, which in Q2 fell to its lowest level since Q3 of 2020. But the Bank of Canada has a similar sort of problem. It's a nice problem to have um, as the US. It remains low. Core inflation has slowed to 3.9 in May from 4.3% in April. Certainly looking at this chart here, we can draw a nice line through those peaks there. So we've also got Canada payrolls today as well. So that could also play a part into the Bank of Canada, um, the Bank of Canada play, but certainly the move lower here does suggest that perhaps we could be due a little bit of a pullback. We've seen a bit of Canada weakness so far since those lows back in June. And could we about to see a little bit of Canada strength on the back of today's Canada payrolls and next week's Bank of Canada rate decision? So it's worth keeping an eye on that um, over the course of the next week or so. Um, so that's it. We've got UK wages on the 11th, um, which is Tuesday, Bank of Canada on Wednesday, US CPI. On Wednesday and again wages data is going to be the key pressure point obviously that went up to 7.2% uh, in April this is for the three months to May um, and and it was a record high outside of the pandemic that did prompt a surge in UK two-year yields um, last month of course we've gone an awful lot higher since then I think it's unlikely that wage growth will slow materially in the short to medium term, simply because um, workers are agitating for much higher pay rises to cope with the higher cost of living. And the fact that the energy price cap um, has only just come down, um, there will be some effect in the July pay packets, but certainly no one will have felt it quite yet. So it's quite likely that wage growth is likely to remain in and around 7%, probably until the end of the year. It's going to make it very difficult for the Bank of England to justify halting, but nonetheless, I think halt they must, simply on the basis of the fact they just don't know or how much of a lag effect is likely to bleed through in Q3 and Q4, and it just makes sense to wait. Why risk crushing the economy and turning it into a dumpster fire um, when you've got rates already at the highest levels that they've been at for 15 or 16 years? It just doesn't make any sense. But who said anything about what the Bank of England does makes sense. Um, we've also got China trade for June coming out, and we've also got the start of US bank earnings season. US bank earnings season we got uh, on Friday. We're going to be starting with JP Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, and Citigroup. Now, um, had a fairly indifferent quarter um, since Q1, but Obviously, JP Morgan has been pretty much the standout of that, been a fairly decent move. Saw record revenues in their Q1 numbers. Total deposits received a lift in Q1, um, coming in at $2.38 trillion. But an awful lot of that was because of the transfer of deposits from Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank. I think the big, the, the big item on as regards to these numbers is how, mu how much of those deposits has JP Morgan and all the other US banks managed to hold on to now the concerns about the US regional banking sector have dissipated somewhat. I wouldn't say they've passed, they've dissipated. I think an awful lot will depend on what the Federal Reserve decides to do with respect to future rate hikes. I think if March was a warning about what rate hikes can do, then it should be a pause for reflection when it comes to pushing your luck, when it comes to doing an awful lot more. Q2 revenues, Q2 revenues for JP Morgan are expected to come in around about $39.6 billion. We're likely to see 
a bit of a slowdown. Um, JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon at the Q1 numbers painted a fairly upbeat outlook saying that consumer spending remained healthy. The bank did raise its full year outlook for net interest income from 73 billion to 81 billion, but Diamond did say he expects inflation to remain higher for longer, which could weigh on the economic outlook. Now, inflation is coming down, could be at 3%. So Q2 is still likely to be a disappointing quarter. Given what we've seen with respect to this price action, you could see a little bit of a slowdown and a little bit of a miss. And I think much will depend on obviously the guidance that these banks give as well. So we've got Wells Fargo's Q2 numbers. Obviously, they have a big presence in the US mortgage market. What sort of um, demand has there been for mortgage lending at rates at current levels? And we've also got the Q2 numbers from Citigroup. So expect lower revenues across the board, but also pay close attention to the economic outlook. What I'm going to do with this JP Morgan chart, it's just going to draw in a nice little trend line here. That's a nice little line that. So it might be worth keeping an eye on that over the course of the next few days as to whether or not we get a drop and whether or not we get a fall through that line. Um, we've also got numbers from Burberry. Um, they hit record highs earlier this year, but since then the luxury sector has taken a little bit of a dive over concern about the resilience of the Chinese consumer and the Chinese recovery. And you can certainly see that in the way that this share price has reacted over the course of the past few weeks. So I think the bigger question that, you know, with respect to Burberry's um, share price is what management think about future demand. When they released their four-year numbers, they kept their 2024 guidance unchanged, which at the time was a little surprising given the strong recovery that we'd seen in the Chinese consumer. Of course, it also suggested that management didn't have much confidence that the Chinese demand rebound was sustainable. Well, that's certainly proven to be the case. Q1 revenues are expected to come in at £632 million for this Q1 earnings update from Burberry. So um, that's pretty much it for this week. As I say, thank you very much for listening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, hope you all have a great weekend. This is Michael Houston talking to you from CMC Markets. Thank you for listening.